We are in Surah Al-Sabah, Surah number 34, Ayah number 43. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Al-Rajim, Bismillahi Rahman Rahim. وَإِذَا تُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُنَا بَيِّنَاتٍ قَالُوا مَا هَذَا إِلَّا رَجُلٌ يُرِيدُ أَنْ يَصُدَّكُمْ أَنْ يَصُدَّكُمْ عَمَّا كَانَ يَعْبُدُ آبَاؤُكُمْ قَالُوا مَا هَذَا إِلَّا إِفْكٌ مُفْتَرَى وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلْحَقِّ لَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ the discussions with the non-believers, especially the Quraysh, the Prophet ﷺ would recite to them the ayat of the Qur'an as revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This ayah summarizes for us the approach and the responses of the non-believers uh, when they would hear the ayat of the Quran that when our ayat that are clear bayinatin, when they are recited upon them they say this is no one except a man who wishes to prevent you from Worshipping what your forefathers worshipped. So since they would have no intellectual response to the depth of the ayat of the Qur'an, the verses of the Qur'an, they resorted to this tribalism and this uh, putting people onto a guilt trip method of... uh, you know, hampering and hindering the progress of human beings, especially their intellectual development and their spiritual development. So they would say this to make them feel guilty. That this man, although he seems to have somewhat of uh, an intellectual appeal and he's captivating, he's mesmerizing, and whatever he is reciting seems to be much more than we can offer. But the net result will be that you will stop being who you are. He wants to stop you from your way of life and he wants to stop you from worshipping the way you and your forefathers used to worship. Since religion at that time for those people except Quraysh was very private and personal and it was a sense of pride and honor to worship the way that they did because they were also the custodians of the Kaaba, the custodians of the Haram, where they would enjoy the privileges of their being a custodian in economics and their social welfare. So without the Kaaba, without the Haram, they would not have prospered economically either. So they accommodated all the idols and forms of paganism and even animism, so that they would reap the benefit of those people who would come for the pilgrimage and come into Mecca for the sake of trade and business and give them their leadership, which they believed they owned and they deserved. So now, this statement which they are making is uh, very well thought out. The words that we see in the Qur'an obviously are the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the way the Quraysh would manipulate this would be to make people feel guilty that you have worshipped this way for centuries or for many, many years and it is because you worship this way that you are who you are and you enjoy the good things of life because of your mode and method of worship. This man seeks honor and prestige and leadership because he doesn't like the leadership to be with you. He wants leadership for himself. And that's why he's saying what he's saying. And they would say that this is nothing except a fabricated lie. 
It is a fabrication, it's forged, and it's a lie that he's just coining these words together so that he would lie to you about the truth, about reality, and about how it is that you should behave and live your lives. وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلْحَقِّ لَمَّا جَاءَهُمْ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ مُبِينٌ And the third contention that they would have, those who disbelieved would say to the truth and about the truth when it came to them that this is nothing except an open form of witchcraft and magic, sihr. A very clear and very open form of magic and witchcraft, which is, was also something that they acknowledged in their custom, in their culture, in their mode of uh, uh, understanding their world view. So in their world view, witchcraft and magic played a big role. So they were able to manipulate this reality which existed in the minds of the people in front of them, that he's using sihr, witchcraft, to manipulate you in order to mesmerize you and in order to draw you close to him. So whatever he's saying, he's saying because of this uh, invested uh, reason, uh, which is to seek leadership and ownership of the haram and the kaaba and so on. Mm-hmm. So this would be one of the many ways that people listen to the truth even today and respond to the truth, even today, that they will set up smoke screens, and they will set up barriers against the truth, and they will use words to defy the truth, no matter how true the truth is. So they're not looking for the truth, they're looking to maintain their power, and maintain their honor, dignity, and pride, and their understanding of how others should understand them, and how their world view should be the, world, the view that dominates the world. Right? Mm-hmm. So there's no difference for what, what happens there. So, as I mentioned before, the Quran exposes human reality, and this is human reality that when a truth is going to override what you already have acquired or developed, or whatever it is you already own, then you're going to defend what is yours, over what is someone else's, even though what someone else has is the truth. Right? So the key word is lil kafaru lil So when the haq, the truth comes down, then those who seek the truth will become impartial and neutral, and they will accept the truth because it is the truth. But those who don't want the truth to undermine them and their standards of success, then they will use words like witchcraft and jadu and sihar and magic and, you know, manipulation or orientation, indoctrination or whatever words that would be appealing to the mode of the time, I guess. So it's no different from what's happening now. وَمَا مِن كُتُبٍ يَدْرُسُونَهَا وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاهُمْ وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ قَبْلَكَ مِنْ نَذِيرٍ The Qur'an is saying that in order for them to equate the Qur'an with uh, witchcraft and magic and with uh, fables and in order for them to condemn the Prophet ﷺ for having an agenda a social political agenda okay. they must be able to compare what the Quran has against something else so the Quran says we have never given them any books any revelations that they study okay. first of all you are from the oral tradition you don't have books you don't write and record and document your knowledge you go on folklore, you go on storytelling, you go on lyrics and music, and you go in on poetry, and you go with whatever is normal for you in your oral tradition. Okay. So you, as a civilization, you don't have the custom of reading books. So we never gave you any books to read. 
وَمَاتَيْنَاهُمْ مِنْ كُدُبِهِمْ وَلُوْسُونَ So we have never given them any books of scripture that you can say that you are reading and you are comparing what Muhammad وسلم, is reciting against those books and those scriptures of revelation. So if you can't compare what someone is saying against anything that you have, then that comparison is false. The Prophet Muhammad is claiming this is revelation. You've never had revelation in your community, ever. If you were the Ahl Kitab, the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, and if they said this is not right because they're comparing this with that, they might have had a platform upon which they can argue. But you don't even have a platform upon which you can argue the case. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَيْهِمْ قَبْلَكَ مِنْ نَذِيرٍ Nor have we sent before you any nadir, any warner, any rasul to them, so that they can say that, yes, uh, this warner, this nabi and rasul who came to us before you, he said this. But even that hasn't happened. Meaning, your analysis of the Qur'an being sahab, or Muhammad sallallahu being a magician or a sahib, or this being a fabricated lie, Okay, is false to begin with because you don't know that tradition. <clears throat> You've never been immersed or submerged in that tradition of reading and writing and receiving revelation and practicing a religion that is based on religion and based on revelation. The Quran is using <clears throat> the inability to understand themselves. Okay? Or their stubbornness to uh, or to uh, not bring out their own weaknesses or you know whatever the status quo is in their culture in their civilization. Your culture and civilization is tribal. It is based on the oral tradition, and within the oral tradition, if you have an argument, let's hear it. But you're not arguing from your tradition because you don't want to expose it to revelation and so on. That's the basic idea behind these uh, ayat. As you can see, the ulama and the scholars developed their polemics and dialectics based on some of these ayat that you can use the methodology the Qur'an is using in such ayat to develop a system of argumentation and a system of dialectics and religious discourse and debate based on how we are seeing the Quraysh in line or against the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa As far as human history and tradition, those who came before them, they also denied and refuted the messengers. So this is normal within human civilization for human beings to reject the truth of another human being out of stubbornness, out of animosity, jealousy, pride, arrogance, insecurity, whatever. Right. These people, meaning the Quraysh, they have not even reached a tenth of the power and the wealth that they had. A tenth being a unit of not exact measure, but exaggeration. Yeah, not even a tenth. So those who came before the Quraysh, they had much more wealth and honor and power and prestige and abilities and you know, even civilizations and armies like the Fir'aun and the Namrud and the people who came with Dawah al-Islam and Suleiman al-Islam, others who fought against them. So the Quraysh are uh, in, in uh, comparison with the other groups of people in the communities who rejected the Ambiya, they're a very, very insignificant uh, minority as far as manpower, wealth, influence and so on. Um, the Quran is now attacking the Quraysh and the people of Mecca especially to say that yes, you do have security, you do own the privileges of being the custodians of the Kaaba and you do own this civilization, albeit a tribal with 
Okay, but your powers compared to the powers of the Namrud and the Fir'aun and uh, the people who came even within the Arabian Peninsula, they're very insignificant. You haven't even reached one tenth of their abilities in anything. وَمَا بَلَغُوا مِعْشَارَ مَا عَدِنَاهُ مِعْشَارَ means one tenth. فَكَذَّبُوا رُسُلِي So even they, meaning the people before you, they belied and denied and refuted, rejected my messengers. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, these were my messengers that they refuted because they refuted me. It is not the messenger they are refuting. It is God himself whom they are refusing to believe in. Then how incredible is their denial of me. <laughs> so when you are refuting the haq uh, in any way, shape or form, then it goes with the idea that you, you are refuting the greatest haq, the one who is the true real, and that is Allah. And haq is one of the names of Allah, the real, the absolute real and the absolute reality. So if there's reality in something, a truth in something, somewhere you're going to be denying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Reality of the cosmos, of existence, of the way to pray and worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of that. So it could be something very insignificant in terms of religion, where you say one plus one is also a truth, but if it is a truth, then you must say it's a truth. Don't refuse to believe in it because you don't want to. Right? How can you then deny and then justify the denial of something that comes from the al haq the ultimate absolute truth and reality that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyway, so throughout the Quran, the Quran confirms the truth. It is called the Musaddiq. The one that came to confirm the truth, not to deny the truth or to hide the truth. If there is a truth anywhere out there in the cosmos, albeit kind of microscopic, minuscule in terms of the macro truth of the universe and uh, who did this and who did that. But still, it's a particle of the truth. So every particle of the truth goes into the cosmic truth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then the Qur'an which is the ultimate truth of all truths. This is how Muslims have seen themselves as being part of the cosmic whole in harmony with the truth wherever it lies. Yeah. So wherever the truth lies, you believe it. There is a truth. Right. But then you have to confirm it. to Musaddiq, you have to make sure it is the truth. Once you have established it is the truth, then yes, you say we believe in it. And if it's not established, then you debate until the time that you either say it's not, or it is. That's the methodology of those who are given a book. Like, min kutubi and the rusuna, ayah number 44. Those who are given the book, the way and methodology of verifying the truth through writing, through the written tradition. Okay? Uh, they also know how to verify data and so on. But, but unfortunately, as you know, sometimes the truth is doctored. <laughs> right. Sometimes the truth is hidden. Sometimes you can conceal the truth in your writing and you can manipulate words in such a way that you speak 50% of the truth and you hide the other 50%. That's the other problem. So there, the process of verification then has to be through wahi. That is this the ultimate truth. Wahi comes to a Nabi, to a Rasul. How do you know this is the true way to worship Allah? Because it's not based on data, your empirical science. It's not based on philosophy or speculation. It's not based on human experience. It's based on something that is super rational. So that's why the word kutub there, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals books to Nabi, to a Nabi, to a Rasul. The Rasul gives you the ultimate truth of what the Haq wants from you. The Haq being Allah. So the Haq will give you the truth through the Nabi. Nabi will perform and you'll observe and absorb what the Nabi says and does and you will practice according to what the Nabi and the Rasul wants. That is the truth about what Allah wants from you as a human society. 
then is not left to speculation anymore. Post wahi. Post wahi, forms of ibadah and aqila, they're not left to speculation. That which is conclusive remains conclusive until the day of judgment if you can prove this is wahi. So everything in the Quran, as far as being the Quran and Allah's kalam and haq, that is true. Then you get into ways and methods of ascertaining the truth in wahi, in its meaning, and then ascertaining the truth in uh, the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, which requires, as you know, study and guidance and rules and regulations and so on. Right. Yeah. But Muslims in general, they, they, they did not shy away from accepting even the smallest of truths in the universe. Right. Means that we, we don't need to sit down and verify every scientific truth if it's already been established as a truth. As you know, in science, it remains a theory until you can verify its universality. Right. This is a theory. It is yet to be proven to be proved to be a fact or a reality. When you prove it to be universal, it applies to everybody, everything. Uh, the same in the same kind of, you know, locale and uh, the uh, variables, then it becomes a fact. But that takes time. You can't experience, you, you can't experiment then with man's right to worship God the way man wants to. Because by that time you'll be dead. It'll be too late for you to verify does God want me to worship in this way? If you leave that to speculation, then that's nonsense. Right? He has a right. He doesn't have a right under the rubric of the U.S. Constitution and any other constitution in the world or the cosmic right to worship the way you want. But is that the truth? So the way you're going to verify the truth about your creator is wahi, revelation. What does God say about himself? And how does God want you to worship? That has to be verified. If someone claims that this is what God wants, then they must prove that it is God's word. Or he is a man of God. Right? Is he Allah's word, which is the Quran? Or he is a man of God, which is the Nabi Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If someone else claims, I know this is what God wants for me, then this is why it's subjective is it okay we're okay with that as long as you don't uh, objectify your subjectivity and you impose on everybody else in the world right so the mission of a rasul is to standardize the modes of uh, aqidah your theology and the modes of worship right and then the moral moral behavior you know that morality has standards and this and that. This is what the Nabi does. He doesn't do that through experimentation. And he doesn't do that by collecting data. And he doesn't do that by subjective uh, understanding of who God is. The Prophet ﷺ went to Hira to do what? To worship Allah. That was his subjective experimentation of how to worship Allah. Right. Allah said, enough of this subjectivity. I'm going to give you a means and a method by which you're going to tell the whole world, this is what I want you to do. And that's called the Qur'an. From Iqra until the last ayah that was revealed. Okay? So that subjective experimentation was repealed by the last word of Allah, which is the Qur'an. Post the Qur'an, this is what Allah wants for every human being. So the Qur'an is universal for everybody. This is what Allah wants because we have proven uh, time and time again the Quran is Allah's word. Definitively. And we have proven time and time again that this is how the Prophet ﷺ worshipped. So we believe in Allah the way the Prophet ﷺ believes in him. And we worship Allah the way the Prophet ﷺ believes uh, worshipped him. And we behave the way he behaved. These are standards of verifying the truth the truth that came from the heavens. If you don't have wahi in your portfolio of knowledge, you are significantly impaired. Why? Because you don't have the third okay, tool of knowledge. 
The first being your five senses, and the second being your mind, your aqal, your intellect. Muslims have the third. So you use all three. So if there's a fact established by your senses that, uh, you know, fire will burn, you don't deny that. The fire does burn. Okay. That's the truth. Okay. If you sit down and say that through the mind I want to prove that one plus one doesn't equal two, and be my guest, the waste of life, waste of time, I don't care. It's the truth. That's your mind. That's the rule of the intellect. Okay. If you say that God is many, that's not the truth. That's a lie. Now, as a human being, do you have the right to say, I don't want to worship one God? Sure you do. But that's still a lie. Having, giving somebody to, the right to do something doesn't necessarily mean it's the truth. It could be for political reasons. It could be for social reasons. It could be for other reasons that we don't know of. But for the reason of worship, it's not a right. That's why the Quran terms shirk as dhulm and injustice and not a right. In the shirka, the dhulm and alim, shirk is a huge injustice. Now, if you go to a place where they're worshipping idols and they're polytheists and all that, do they have the right to exist? Sure they do. Do they have the right to do? Sure they do. But is it the right of uh, Allah to say that they are doing something that's wrong? Yes. Then you give God his right to, to condemn those people. You have the right to say this, and then Allah has the right to do something. I would hope <laughs> the divine has rights too, right? In, the, in our methodology, we say that there is hukukullah and hukukul ibad. You have Allah's rights and then you have the rights of human beings and servants. So if all human beings get together one platform and say, we are going to deny God's rights, Allah will say, fine, I'll meet you when I meet you. Right? I mean, it's just the, the arrogance of the human being to say that I have the right to worship Allah the way I want to, but God doesn't have the right to tell me how to worship Him. Hello? Who are you worshipping? Are you worshipping your nafs? Are you worshipping something else? Are you worshipping the right to worship the way you want to? Or are you worshipping Allah, the absolute, the abstract, the one who is in the ghayb? So the issue with Muhammad وسلم, and Quraysh was that we've been worshipping this way for centuries. Who are you to tell us we can't worship this way? Because it is very sacred. Okay? It is a religion. It's very sacred. It's very private. And it's very precious to us. And if you're going to condemn the whole society for polytheism or idolatry or whatever, then you're condemning us in every other aspect of life. And we will not tolerate that, which they did not. So Allah subhanahu wa brings down these ayat of the truth through wahi, through revelation, as a favor to the Prophet وسلم, and through him to us. So revelation is an added value to the knowledge of human beings. Okay? It adds to the truth where the human being is incapable of uh, understanding or perceiving that side of the truth. So there's a partial truth here and partial truth in the ghayb. So the wahi brings the knowledge of the ghayb into the equation of human beings which is a ni'mah. Uh, human beings must see revelation as a ni'mah. Yeah. Which is what the next time is encouraging us to do. قُلْ إِنَّمَا أَنَا عِذُكُمْ بِوَاحِدًا Say, O Muhammad وسلم, that I'm going to advise you about one one thing, بِوَاحِدًا yeah. أَن تَقُومُوا لِلَّهِ مَثْنَى وَفُرَادًا That I want you to stand in front of Allah for the sake of Allah either in two in pairs, as a group, and then as individuals, and then think, and then contemplate. So it is a very, very brave challenge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, now bringing forward to all of human beings through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Now I want you to do one thing for me. Get together as a committee in groups, in pairs, matna means in pairs, but also in groups. 
that sometimes when you think as a committee, as a group, you may come to some conclusion that you won't be able to come to if you're thinking about the issue and the project by yourselves. Wafurad, and then also by yourselves. Alone, one on one, just stand for Allah, think and uh, try to uh, reflect and contemplate about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or about His creation. So the Quran is encouraging human beings to take time out to reflect, to contemplate, and to think. Not only as individuals, which most of us do, but also as groups. Then see what conclusion comes to you. So here for the people of Mecca, Allah is challenging the Quraysh that go sit in pairs of two people, as a group, two, 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 and then discuss amongst yourselves, is this person here, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, is he mad? Is he possessed? Is he a musician? Is he a poet? See what conclusion comes to you. Then invariably you'll say, he's not. Ma bi sahibukum min jinnah. That uh, the, your sahib here, your companion, the one who was with you 40 years before revelation came to him, okay? there is no sign of madness. There's no sign, no trace of madness. For 40 years, this man has become the most accomplished human being that you ever knew. Now, all of a sudden, he's mad. Or oh, there's a jinn with him. Or oh, he's a poet. He's never composed poetry in front of you. He's never read a poem of his own. He's never claimed that he has a book or he reads and writes. Think. Sit down and think. Okay? Bring all the facts and the details and data together, together over 40 years and then make a decision based on 40 years of living with him. Sahibukum, your companion. You know him. You know his genealogy, you know his family, you know his roots, you know his offspring, you know who he's married to, you know his business. You know everything there is to know about it. You are in the oral tradition. You know everything about each other. That's how the oral tradition works. You know everything. Right? It's an open society. Then see which conclusion you come to. It's a very powerful tool that the Quran is introducing uh, to the Muslims also that look at the evidence, sit down and think. Yeah. When you sit down and think, the, the evidence will show you the truth. What is the truth here? Your companion is not at all mad. He's not possessed. That's the only conclusion you can draw, whether you're in groups or you're alone. Only one thing. So the Quran is saying that we want you to think, ثُمَّ تَتَفَكَّرُوا we want you to think, but think impartially. Think with the evidence. Don't think outside of the evidence. Think of how others would think outside of your rubric. And then compare your thoughts to somebody who is <coughs> outside of your rubric. And you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made this man a possessed demon or someone who claims that he is now receiving knowledge from the jinn. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In huwa illa nadhirun lakum. All he is, is an open, open warner for you. Bayna yadi adhalim shadeed. Warning you in front of a very, very severe punishment. So he's here to serve you so that you don't destroy yourselves. He's here to serve you so that Allah doesn't destroy you. He's here to save you from you. And you know that this is his trademark for 40 years. He's the most kind, most generous, most concerned citizen of Mecca. And that you know, he's the most trustworthy. So the evidence will tell you that his claim is true. So that's how you... Now justify and judge the prophethood of Muhammad وسلم, in the context of the Quraysh. So the Quraysh knew exactly what the Quran is saying. Said, okay, so this is what the Quran is saying. The evidence is very much against what we're saying, and the evidence is very much in favor 
of what Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is saying. Okay. Now, there's only one <coughs> thing left, and that is perhaps he has a vested interest. So the Quran is asking Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam to declare that he has no vested interest. Qul ma saltukum min ajrin. Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that I have never asked you for any ajr. I've never asked you for any wage, any money, any funds, any assistance, any political position, any form of power or governance. Bahulakum, it is all for you. Whatever I'm asking you is all for you, nothing for me. I have no vested interest in terms of material gain in this world that I'm calling because I want to be your governor, your ruler, your chief. Okay, you're a negotiator, or this and that. I want all your money. Nothing of the sort. So the Nabi, the Rasul, has no vested interest in any material gain that the Ummah has to offer. And that is why he kept himself very frugal. And at the end of his days, mashallah, he had nothing to tell the rest of the Ummah that he gained no material gain from being a Nabi. So that others would say, that Muhammad Sasa was true to his word, that he remained a pauper, uh, or he became a pauper by the end of his life. At this point of his time, maybe he still had some money left from Khadija, but when he made Hijrah, he had nothing left. And the day he died, they had nothing in the house. So this statement is true. Qul ma sa'altukum min ajr. I've never asked you for any money, any compensation, any wage, Anything from the Department of Finance, from the State Treasury. I'm not employed by the state. Etc. He gave everything away, whatever little he had, to show people that Nabuwa and Risala prophethood is for Allah. Period. So once wealthy, and then at the end he had nothing. In Ajriya illa ala Allah, my reward simply is on Allah. Meaning that whatever reward, inshallah, I receive, I will receive at the hands of Allah. After I leave this world in the barzakh, on the day of judgment and in Jannah. That is something you can't give me, even if you wanted to. Right? No human being can give you comfort in the grave. No human being can help you when you're resurrected. No human being can be giving you any ni'mah in Jannah. That's all Allah. So whatever I'm doing, I'm doing simply for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is how the Ummah uh, honors the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That it is a very powerful statement to make in front of the leaders of the Quraysh who were now all about honor, prestige, pride, uh, ownership, custodianship of the Kaaba. And also the, the economic, uh, you know, what do you call it? Four and the, uh, the tribal s- society of the Hijaz of the Arabia Peninsula. So they could not understand how a human being would be this selfless. The Quran says he's already proven to you over the past 40 years that he's always been selfless. Think. Go, group yourselves into workshops and two people each and see. And to this point, 40 years, what kind of a man has he been? Which are the words of Khadija, mentioned by Bukhari and others, that uh, you are like this, you are like this. So the proof will show you that he has never had a vested interest whenever he was helping people before Nabuwa. Even before prophethood, he was selfless. After prophethood, he became even more selfless. So then, Allah says, then in ajriya illa ala Allah, say to them that my reward is upon Allah, wa huwa ala kulli shayin shaheed. That he's a witness, that he's a witness to everything. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala witnesses what's in my heart, and he's a witness to what I'm saying now, and he'll be witness for me on the day of judgment. So this is the truth from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala projects Muhammad 
sallallahu alayhi wa onto the scene of the Quraysh, the custodians of the Kaaba and Haram, uh, so that Muslims may now take a lesson uh, from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when they're doing the work of deen. And they're promoting this universality of uh, worship, universality of Tawheed, universality of ethics and morals, that they say that we are not doing this because of political expediency, right? Because if we are disingenuous, people will read right through us. Uh, For political gain and opportunism, we say, let's say this, and then the goalposts change the next time some other president comes into uh, the White House. Then you say something else eight years later, then something else 12 years later. You don't shift your goalpost uh, because you want some gain, some worldly gain, because that's not what our prophet did. The haq remains the haq forever. The haq, the truth, doesn't change its uh, goalpost. It doesn't, uh, you know, advance its, 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 uh, its, its goal simply because it wants to control people. Yeah, one plus one equals two, and it remains the truth, no matter who comes into power. Is that true? Fire will always burn, and doesn't matter who comes into power. So Allah is one. That ultimate truth in the universe will always remain the truth, no matter who becomes Muslim or doesn't become Muslim. That truth will not change. Will it? No. So that we as Muslims must be careful that we don't move the goalposts of truth to fit our agenda. The Prophet ﷺ said, قُلْ مَا سَأَلْتُكُمْ مِنْ أَجْرِ I'm not asking you for any ajr. Yes, there are rules of negotiation and uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, what's it called? Living to, to the coexistence and all of that good stuff. Okay? But you remain dedicated and loyal to the ultimate truth that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Quran and the hereafter and so on. Allah will always be witness to whatever we say and whatever we do and whatever we promote. This is the message of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to us in the Quran and through the Sunnah so that we are first of all equipped and to understand and appreciate two things. Yeah. In this passage of ayat which we have read today, uh, there are two take-home points. One is that the Qur'an does not shy away from uh, debate. Uh, the Qur'an doesn't shy away from debate. The Qur'an didn't allow any Nabi to shy away from debate. Uh, so you must be able to argue your point in a very effective way. But the point must be the truth. First establish that the point you're making is the truth. If you know this is the truth, without any doubt, then you must be able to argue your point for the sake of promoting and for the sake of uh, doing your job as someone who believes in the truth. And the second, the Quran is saying that, uh, you know, think about the evidence that you have in front of you. Think, contemplate, use your abilities of observation and then... Uh, you analyze whatever you have in front of you in order for you to make the right conclusion. Okay. So behind these ayat that are as a rebuttal to the Quraysh, there are many evidences for the Muslims of today to sit down and really think about how we are going to represent the truth that is in the Quran to others so that we become part of the ultimate truth in the cosmos and the reality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made us part of, inshallah. And we will stop here today. Jazakum Allah khair. We will see you all soon, inshallah. And the men have about half an hour uh, to do whatever they want to do, inshallah. Then you will have to vacate the whole building, all of you, because the women are invading us today. They have a program in this hall. Jazakumullah. Subhanallah. Alhamdulillah. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Subhanallah.